gentlemen, and welcome to the Source Material Comics Podcast. It is book two with Mark Radulich. If you listened to our discussion previously, we're working First our all, way up. We're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you should be apologizing to me because I have to edit that. That's the, <laughs> that's the person you should be apologizing. Uh, you love me, Jesse Starcher. Oh, yes. Get, get very good at saying that. Because <laughs> <laughs> just keep practicing. Bad Weekend. This is another image comic, but this is Ed Brubaker. A criminal novella by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. Colors, 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 do, 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 colors, 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 by Jacob Phillips. So there's our creative team. This gets released in 2019. <laughs> it's a two issue. It's from um, a comic called Criminal that Brubaker was writing. These are two issues. I think issue two and issue three of Criminal. I'm going to go ahead and read the synopsis here real quick, and we'll kind of get into it. Just in time for convention season. Now, this is straight off of, I think, I nabbed this off Goodreads, I believe. This is totally uh, a meta story. This is oh, a comic yeah. book writer writing about being a comic book writer. Absolutely. It's fucking great. Yeah. Absolutely. Just in time for convention season, the ultimate comic con crime tale. Comics won't just break your heart. Comics will kill you. Hal Crane should know he's been around since practically the beginning, stuck at an out-of-town convention waiting to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award. Hal's Weekend takes us on a dark ride through the secret history of a medium that's always been haunted by crooks, swindlers, and desperate dreamers. So I want to make sure that people understand the setting of this book first, because that's pretty important. 1997 is when this book takes place, and it's at a fictional, I'm pretty sure, fictionally called Comic Fest, which was a convention, uh, comic convention at the time. And you got to think about, and it's mentioned in this book, the state of the comic book in industry at that point. The state of the industry was not good. Mark, you, I know you'd collected comics for a little while. Were you collecting in the late 90s at all? Like buying anything? All right. So I would say after high school, I stopped collecting comics for a fairly lengthy period of time. I'm pretty sure I was collecting from like 87, 89 until probably the end of high school, which would have been 1994. I, I, the last like thing I can remember about comic books was like the Todd McFarlane Spider-Man. Yeah. And we talked about that because I think more specifically because of the Superblog team up where Chris, where the theme was like special. I can't remember the was phrase. Gimmick covers? Yeah, well, like, it was like it was just gimmicks in general in comics. So like mm -hmm. gatefolds and multiple comics, whatever. And I remember we actually did the that first uh, iteration of the Todd McFarlane Spider-Man for the Superblog team up, if you'll remember, because that's the comic that broke my father. Yeah. Yeah, he stopped collecting comics because he was like, I can't do the multiple covers thing anymore. I'm like, well, just buy one cover then. Just buy the issue of the one that you like. Don't feel the need to buy multiple covers. And he was like, no, the comic book industry is stupid. I don't want to do it anymore. Okay, Dad. I think when he stopped, I kind of stopped too because that was a thing we were doing together. Plus, I was into film and college and girls, and I just didn't care anymore. If you go to Google and just type in, when did the comic book market crash? <laughs> I'm going to read you. 1999. I will, I will, well, I'll read you specifically what it says. The comic book speculator market reached a saturation point in the early 1990s. So this is specifically probably what your dad's talking about. Speculator, The speculator boom was all about, oh, I want that number one. You're getting a number one because it's supposed to be well, Superman number one is worth a million dollars. This one's going to be worth a million dollars at some point. Well, what you, you well, didn't have the Legends of the Dark Knight comic. I know we've talked about this because I said because I, I bring up the story specifically that that Legends of the Dark Knight that Bane originally appears in. But he's not quite Bane yet. Mm -hmm. That was like a zillion dollars at one point. Right. You were speculating like the first appearance of somebody is going to be worth so much money. I'm going to be able right. to retire off of this. What people didn't realize is that. Well, Superman number one is worth so much because number one, it's so old. And number the other thing is, is that it's so rare. If you are buying a number one of a comic that has a print run of 100,000 comics, ladies and gentlemen, it's not going to be as rare and it's not going to be worth as much. So all right. these people that were speculating all this back in the day, they were speculating events, issue numbers, stuff like that, first appearances. The market's going to crash because people are going to realize that, oh, wait a second, this stuff is not worth as much as I thought it was. Right. And people are going to stop buying comics. So it says, and finally collapsed between 1993 through 1997. Oh. Well, you also got to remember, comics used to be 10 cents, right. then they were 25 cents, then they were 50 cents, then they were a dollar. Right. When they got to be $3, when the same $10 could buy you less comics, but you were spending it all on Spider-Man number one, Todd right. McFarlane Spider-Man number one, right. like you start to wonder, is this really worth my time and money? Exactly. And at this point, what, what really 
hits the business hard is the other sentence in this paragraph. Two thirds of all comic book specialty stores closed yep. in that period of time. So everybody that's selling your product is now not making as much money, and they're shutting their doors. Now your product's not going to go anywhere. Well, I think the other thing that's happening around this time is comic book shops are dying on the vine. The ones that are surviving are diversifying. They're tapping into the Magic: The Gathering market. Magic: The Gathering, right? It'll, you know, so so comic book. Like, if you go, if you look now, and you know this because you're more familiar with comic book stores than I than I am. But comic book stores just don't sell comics anymore. They are gaming gathering places. They there's ta there's always a, an area full of tables that people can come in. They play D and D. They play Magic. They play Pokemon. They you know they do whatever. It's a it's a place for the people in that culture to hang out and do stuff and be social. Oh, and oh, by the way, they're selling comics there too. But they're not just selling comics. They're selling T-shirts. They're selling pewter figurines. Right. They're selling right. Funko Pops. D dude, there are comic book stores where I swear to God, the the sign out front says comics. It might as well say Funkos. <laughs> Right, dude. That's Funko all they're Pop. fucking selling. It's right. one shelf of comics. There's literally a comic book store I used to take my kids to, and it was like 90% Funko Pops and a shelf of comics. Yeah. This have called itself a comic book store. That's like me saying I'm a prostitute. But... <laughs> <laughs> Only get paid once in a while. Yeah, but let's just, <laughs> but I'm not ever really getting like I'm not so you know I say I'm a prostitute. What I really am is just easy. You know, <laughs> I, <laughs> there's no fucking way it's a comic book store. It's a Funko store. It, it, it's a comic book store in name only. Right. But those are the ones that survived right. somehow. The last part of this sentence says uh, sentence says and numerous publishers were driven out of business. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a, I'm over at um, my sister's house yesterday and mm -hmm. me and justin are going through he's like hey I, I bought five long boxes a long time ago let's go through i got a ton of doubles because i got it off of a what used to be a shop the one thing that blew our minds is that we were going through and we're sorting these comics and i told him i said let's do this we had five long boxes to go through they were no order let's sort by company and then that'll give us an idea at least at that point We'll know which company. All the Marvel comics will be in one stack. All the DC comics will be in another stack. All the Image comics will be another stack and another stack. There was legitimately half to three quarters of a long box of just random issues from completely unknown publishers. That if I were to tell you, hey, you ever heard of Lightning Comics? Hey, you had a, have you ever heard of Defiant Comics? These were publishers that got into the game and then were immediately out of the game because yeah. nobody was buying these comics and it saturated the market. And I'm not, I, I took a picture yesterday. I'll have to send it to you, but our, the kitchen table and another table of his was just full of single random issues from different publishers. You know, I, 10 minutes of us talking about the market in 97, this convention is going on, which is kind of conventions are all over the place. You know, you've heard of comic con. Now you've heard of San Diego comic con. You've heard of the other local comic cons in your area, but 97, live, just hang on. We live in a culture where people don't realize that that's its full name. The San Diego comic book convention, right? Because when people think of cons now, they don't think of comic books. They, they think of cosplay. They think of autograph signings. They think of, they think of cosplays like I took my daughter to a couple of anime conventions and for a lot of them, it was just about playing dress up. They, they wanted to put a costume on and they wanted to walk around in said costume. Yep. That that was like almost the point of it. You, you used to go to comic book conventions because that was a place to find rare comics. But that was like in the year of our Lord, 1965. <laughs> Yeah, it is not that way now. And to the point that people don't know that comic book, that that a con is short for convention, right. which is short for comic book convention. <laughs> Gosh, I remember the Holiday Inn, you know, right up the road in Parkersburg, West Virginia, having a convention at one point. But just mm -hmm. like you said, it's just people coming there to sell comics. That's all it was. Yeah. And people there to buy comics, try and find that those older comics. So in 97, yeah, for this is comic fest in this book. Uh, and we have a couple of characters. One was mentioned, Hal Crane, who is this artist uh, who apparently now he's pretty cantankerous. He's a drunk. He's uh, but he's been in the business long enough that they're going to offer him a lifetime achievement award. So he is the hero to many. We'll just put it that way, especially he was the hero to Jacob, who was his, uh, his assistant at one point. Now, Jacob has met his hero, worked for his hero, and Hal Crane is while he respects his work, he's not his hero any longer. But Jacob's yeah. been Jacob has been called to kind of hang out with Hal during the convention, basically be his handler yep. during that time to keep, make keep sure that 
keep him from running away. <laughs> keep him, yeah, keep him on track. Get get him to his appointments because Hal apparently has a hard time doing that. Jacob is acting in the role of a daddy dom, and why did it have to go there? We all wonder. Make, <laughs> why do I have to make everything weird? Listen to me. Hal is a uh, non-functioning adult, and he needs someone to tell him when to do things and where to be places. Okay. Yeah. And and I'm noticing this is a common thing with adults so that if they just struggle with adulting and they need a daddy dom to tell them when to do this, when to do that. It's not a sexual thing, Jesse. You stop making everything sexual. I'm just saying that we all let at me, one point or another. Let me type another, in daddy dom into Google real quick and see what non-sexual thing pops up. I wouldn't if you don't want to be bothered by the <laughs> FBI. Um, <laughs> we all at some point or that wouldn't you want a daddy do, don't you want to take your mental load off jesse would, don't you want to get rid of your mental load just spray your mental load uh, and be free it. of it i knew it <laughs> just <laughs> just just release your mental load and uh-huh. have and have a daddy dom a daddy. somebody else takes it on right yeah, yeah and yeah. it just tells you when to take your medication you know, when to do this, when to do that, makes plans for you so that you don't have to think about those things and you can dedicate that 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 mental energy into something else. That's what Jacob is doing for Hal. It's not sexual, Jesse. Stop making everything sexual. It definitely isn't sexual in this book. That's it for is sure. Way I, not I sexual take comfort in, this book. in that. Yeah, no, no. This is not in any way, shape, or form a sexual book. <laughs> So the plot, <laughs> keep this old man out of trouble is kind of tough when he's in town and he's got plans to get some payback on some people he believed stole his art. One of the things we learn about how he's been in the industry for quite a long time. He was working for a man by the name of Archie Lewis, uh, who was a newspaper strip author slash artist as well. And there's a moment in Hal's history where he gets into the car with Archie Lewis and Archie Lewis has a bad accident. After that moment in history, Hal became a different person. He definitely becomes a lot more hard to deal with. You know, as the years goes on, he's he's drinking a lot more. Something happened. We don't know what, and that's mainly the driving part of this of this story. Trying to figure out why he is who he is. Plus, the other part is who stole his art? Who stole Hal's art? I mean, there's a point where Hal walks into a bathroom after a guy he's talking to and pulls a gun on him to try and find out who took his art because he has no idea who did it. And then, of course, at the end of this book, we find out who did quite a revelation. This is a really good story. It's, you know, it's only three years old, four years old here in a few months. I almost don't want to spoil it because it's a great revelation at the end as we find out what the actual events were. Ed Brubaker, was he the sole reason you picked this up off the shelf or was there anything else that spoke to you here? It was the genre and it was Ed Brubaker. I'll tell you some of the things that I liked out of this book. There's a lot of name drops of actual creators in the business. So you can kind of tell. I wondered, and I wanted to look this up, but I wondered if Ed Brubaker experienced this at some point or heard a story. This very well could be a true story. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this <laughs> yeah. very well. The industry this, is that This deep. rings true. Yeah. Like Brubaker may be talking about how Crane... But you could substitute so-and-so's name in there, and that's what actually happened. Who knows? I mean, it, but regardless, it's still a great story. Hal's trying to find this art. That's kind of like what you got going on. He's, uh, he's kind of unhinged. You don't know what he's going to do. I'll tell you my other favorite part of this book is towards the end when Hal's getting up to get his Lifetime Achievement Award. And everybody's ex- – well, I say everybody. Jacob and the other guy there, I can't remember his name, is – ready for him to just go off Mm because that's what he's expecting him to do and he doesn't and then at the very end he does (laughs) he ends up (laughs) socking the guy and breaking his jaw i mean original art's a big deal i I know you've gotten autographs people have sent you some stuff as a matter of fact we know an artist benjamin j cologne who has sent you some original pieces if i remember correctly so uh, that is a big deal to people and that's what kind of makes this story interesting is that i could see an artist getting really upset the fact that he can't find his original art and that somebody may have stolen it and this guy how he's been known as an art thief himself but i mean that's kind of a big deal uh when you're when your original creation is out there on the black market and you don't you never okayed it this reminds me and i'm really not going to be weird about this it legitimately reminds me of something that the sort of antagonism and consternation between metallica fans and metallica when Napster was a thing. Oh, and, yeah. And this is what I mean by, like, always do the right thing, even if it hurts you. Look, I absolutely took advantage of Napster. I sold lots of music back in the day. I, I had the Lime Wire and got all the viruses that came with it. You know, I, ga- I absolutely gave my computer gynorrhea on several occasions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we all did. 
but I took Lars aside. When Lars came out and was like, you don't understand. If there's a difference between recording your music off the radio or even like dubbing tape to tape. There's a degradation of sound. The problem with digital music is you're getting a digital copy. There's no degradation. You're essentially getting the same track that you would on a store-bought album. You are, in effect, stealing our original audio, copyrighted audio recording. And that's why you can't do Napster or there has to be <clears throat> there has to be costs uh, factored into you know the cost of selling the product into your use of the Napster product. Right. Which is why now you know you pay a subscription for Spotify for every download I think an artist gets, you know, like pennies on the dollar per play. So if you're like Metallica um and you're getting let's say a penny per play, but it, you know, but there's a billion plays a year, you get a billion, a billion pennies. Here's the deal. And I absolutely agreed with Lars that your intellectual property, your, your copyrighted property, it's yours. And if somebody has it without permission, whether or not they're keeping it in their home or they're reselling it or whatever, that it's still, it's still stealing. Hal is completely in the right. I mean, okay. he doesn't really have I, to I hold somebody at gunpoint, but his, his shit got took. He has the right to get it back, but yeah. somebody, somebody, stole his artwork and then sold it or whatever that person is in possession is illegally in possession of said product case okay. closed right and I, I don't yeah i definitely don't disagree with that <clears throat> house way of going now, about going about now, getting it is a different right. story legitimate question mark radlich never meet your heroes yeah yeah my friend jen doesn't like anthrax anymore because scott ian was mean to her so for, you know what triple h <laughs> i remember going to a house show and I was, you know, screaming and yelling and carrying on and having fun at the show. And Triple H turned and looked at me. I was with Lisa Hotass, Lisa Margaroli, Elvira in the um, Weird Al movie, by the way. Oh, my good, okay. my good friend, Hotass uh, Lisa Margaroli, who went to Hollywood to become a star. She uh, she plays Elvira in the pool scene in Weird Al and uh, the Weird, the Al Yankovic movie. I can't wait to see that. Yeah, I've been wanting <laughs> to watch that. She uh, she went with a bunch of us nerds to a house show at the Nassau Coliseum. And I was screaming and hollering and hooting and having a good old time. And Triple H turned to me and he was mean to me. He Aww. was like, when you get he was like, when you get a girl, then we'll talk. I was like, oh, that was well, unnecessary. now he's he was heel at the time, though, right? He was a heel at the time. Yes. OK. All right. Well, you can't can't base it off that. I mean, he's a heel for fuck's sake. I was That's a customer and the customer is always right. He was a douche. Customer what? At the fucking <laughs> wrestling show? <laughs> Yes, I was a customer at a pro wrestling oh, show. Oh, give me a fucking break. You asked. When you paid for the ticket, you asked <laughs> to be razzed by a heel. I did not. That was oh, not bullshit. part of the purchase price. You can't. That is not a fucking meet your hero story. Now, if you would have, like, ran into him in the elevator, okay. I, I still almost would say that he, does, he has the have to be, be like, mean to you. <laughs> does he? Yeah, true. Does he? Does it have to be a negative interaction? Because I have a positive interaction. Oh, go ahead. I mean, uh, it, well, I'm not asking for never meet okay. your heroes. I, I've talked about this before. That time that I introduced myself to Ice T at a strip joint. Me and Tom were at the strip club in Los Angeles. I, I turn and I see this entourage walk in, and in, in the middle of the, in the butt of the entourage was Ice T, and he's sitting down just chilling. And we didn't like run over there, like knock him over, like Uncle Ice. You know, we were just right. watching him for a while, and we were watching him interact with the girls and everything. And finally, I got up enough nerve to go over there. Now, remember, I because I'm not parented appropriately, as you may have figured out, I was allowed to listen to anything I wanted in elementary school. So I was listening to Ice T solo stuff when it was contemporary. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> okay, so I'm like six, seven, eight years old listening to Ice T's "Let's Get Fuck Naked and Fuck." <laughs> It was, uh, it was an acronym. It was an acronym, but that's what it stood for. Uh -huh. So I was a huge fan of Ice T, and by this point, I'm in my 20s. I have to be. Yeah, this is this is 1999. Because uh, if Tom was in Los Angeles, it was for the Phantom Menace. So we, you know, so what better way to celebrate going to see Star Wars with your best friend than to go to a strip joint and see? Tits? Oh yeah, right. That's how you, that's how that goes, right? Oh man, they're coming out to duel the fates, dancing <laughs> yeah. on them poles, right? <laughs> I walk over and I see Ice T, and I'm just like, "Hey, I just want you to let you know that I was inappropriately parented. No, that I was a bit a big fan of yours for, since I was a kid. I love Body Count. I love your solo stuff. I just think you're great, and I wanted to shake your hand and say I'm a huge fan." And he was like, "Get away from me, honky!" No, oh, um, nice. said, <laughs> I would love for that. He, he <laughs> said, "He said, stop touching me, you white motherfucker. I'm only interested in your women." So, no, he said, 
I, I walk over, I introduce myself, shook his hand. He was like, hey, that's really nice. I really appreciate that. Thank you for being a fan. And I said, thank you for your great music, Ice-T, your well-worded intellectual music about shooting f- people, dealing drugs, and, you know, going to see strippers. <laughs> and he was like, you're welcome. You're welcome for my contribution to the culture. Yes. I walk away. Nice. Because I'm me. I'm always engaging because strippers are people too, Jesse. Oh, they are. You know this is true. I have. These these yeah. people have thoughts. They have dreams. They and I'm that. here for them. I'm like the daddy dom of the stripper verse. Okay. Okay. I'm okay. here. To, and so they talk to me, Jesse. They tell me things. They tell you things. They tell me big things. Okay. Okay. Big, big things. Big things. <laughs> <laughs> and so the strippers. <laughs> We'll get there. We'll get back to the comic book in a second. This has everything to do with it. This is, I have been told by Jesse, who loves me, that this relates to the comic. <laughs> so anyway, she sits down with us. She's like, can I tell you? She's like, did you go over and introduce yourself to Ice-T? And I'm like, oh, I did. Was I, should I have left him alone? I, I didn't really want to cause a scene or anything. I just, I'm a huge fan. And she was like, no, you're fine. He's such a loser, though. Why? Oh. Why did you go over there? I'm like, wait, what? He's like, yeah, he's in here every week. The guy's like a big time star and he's in here every week. That's strippers. judgmental. Does, does like he not have guy, anything better? To, does he, he? The stripper. The stripper was like, does he not have anything better to do? Wow. Is he not yeah. like tipping him or something? Well, or is that what the problem is? I, I, I mean, don't she, know. But apparently, she felt like he could have used his time better than this. Oh yeah. Okay. You know, future star of Law and Order. Uh, <laughs> I think that that's what you. I would like to know where Kitty McButt Cheeks is at right now. <laughs> how she's doing? Okay, Kitty McButt Cheeks could have given up her g-string <laughs> and moved on. She could be look. She could right now be a doctor for all we know. Uh, okay, sure. She's putting herself through college. Right. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's great. You know, listen. I mean, the in studio audience would love us to get back to the comic book. Uh, okay. All right. Well then, I've got an I've I've got another question for you here. Let's try. What's your question? This is another serious question that definitely is one of the you know bigger themes through Bad Weekend and yes, money and your dream job. Both Jacob and Hal are both thrilled to get into this industry to make comics because that's mm-hmm. what they've dreamt to do. That's what their talent has brought them there to do. But it's money and politics that really ruin the relationship. Is that something that you've seen happen plenty of times? I mean, that's the truth in everything, right? Sure. I mean, I went to Hollywood to try to break into making movies, and the little bit that I saw up close was utterly distasteful that it drove me into social work. Oh, wow. Like That's, that's the short version of that story. Okay. And I almost want to ask you to uh, give me, like, some examples. I mean, was there something that really, like, one big event where you were like, Okay. Well, no, I, I was not privy to the sec- to, to to the perversions of Hollywood, but I saw enough that I was like, it felt like such like a cattle call. It felt like such a rat race that whatever talent you might have had, did, you had to be in the right place at the right time. And it was you had to hustle just to put yourself in someone's way in order to be seen. And I didn't feel like it was worth it as much as I enjoy the uh, the industry. I didn't feel like. The things that you needed to maybe succeed, and this is a definite maybe here, was worth it. So, you know, I don't need to get into the whole like wrestling and like porn stuff that I, that I eventually dovetailed into, but that's a whole other story. What but was X X W? What was X, X, XPW? XPW, right? Yeah, but just but even before that, like just like writing screenplays and trying to get them sold and like getting them on like the festival circuit and stuff like that, and just feeling like I got I had no guidance and. You know, people were just like trampling each other just to get the possibility of being seen by somebody who might make them. I'm like, this is not for me. Yeah. You know, right. some people are built for that. Some people are like, yes, that is that. I like the hustle. I, I didn't like the hustle. It's pretty evident sometimes that a lot of what you think would be people that would just love being famous. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hollywood, their fame has brought them plenty of wealth. But my goodness, you, yeah. there's so many cost stories. Of their soul. Yeah. That the cost of their soul, at the cost of mm-hmm. other things, they've. Yep. They're definitely not as happy. And that's where Hal is by the end of this book. You know, he's trying to reclaim, you know, a small piece of his, like, dignity. I remember the line that really stuck out to me in the book was, so what were those pages you were looking for? Some stuff I drew back when I was working for R.T. Lewis. Don't worry about it. It was just a mistake. I made one of many, right? But I wanted to keep this one to myself. It's hard to explain. Like, that kind of resonates with me. Like, sometimes, as, as, look, I've just spent an hour in a previous show that's aired already, and then another hour here... And I'm, I'm telling funny stories and I'm doing shtick and I'm trying to, you know, make our shows a little bit different from the ones you do with Evan and Dean and everybody, you know, kind of like our little special thing. And part of that is me doing shtick. 
But there's even but there's even times and there's stuff in my life that I'm just like, yeah, I don't need people don't need to know about that. Right. That's that's personal to me. That's my own little bit of shame that I need to deal with in process. And it doesn't need to be public knowledge. You know, right. You know, for as much as I like to publicly humiliate my wife, there's plenty of things I don't talk about on the air because she she deserves she Listen. as as much as I do, as much as Hal does, as much as anybody, just, you know, retains the right to have dignity and respect. My final thoughts are if you get a chance, read this. If you are a fan of the industry in any way, this probably will speak to you a little bit more than somebody who isn't. All in all, still a good mystery and a killer ending, in my opinion. This one also had kind of a cinematic quality to it. I could definitely see it being like a Netflix movie or something. Some of the fun of putting together a movie is the setting that the movie takes place in. And I think a kind of crime noir in the middle of a comic book convention screams Netflix movie. I agree. I agree. Be good stuff. Yes. All right. Let's hear the plugs, man. Tomorrow night, uh, in theory, we're reviewing Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania. In theory, on Wednesday, because we're in the middle of Black History Month, myself and the Protocol son, Jason Teasley, uh, will be reviewing a triple feature of Foxy Brown, Sheba Baby, and Black Mama, White Mama. Yes, an entire triple feature dedicated to the one and only Pam Greer. At the height of her powers, baby. Her height of her Afro sheen, big tits, I'm black and I'm proud, black exploitation power. Pam Greer, Voxy Brown, Sheba Baby, Black Mama, White Mama. Three of my favorites for Black History Month. And then I'm getting a colonoscopy. But when oh. I'm done with that. Oh, goodness. <laughs> but when I'm done being violated by the medical professionals, you and I, speaking of being violated, are going to talk Treme, season one. Oh, yeah, that's right. Treme. Yeah. You know, know goat, what... whores in, goat whores in an episode of Treme. Are they seriously? Yeah, no shit. You just went and saw them not too long ago. I saw them uh, Friday night. They weren't the first time they were not able to show up because of vehicle. That's right. They did not show because of vehicle. (laughs) Uh, This time the vehicle came through. (laughs) (laughs) This time, this time the vehicle did not break down. So, yes, we were. I was able to be uh, I was able to take uh, the Kelsey. Everyone should have a Kelsey. Okay. Uh, I, I took my Kelsey out for an evening. We late we we told her take off her apron and her maid's uniform. Uh, we took the ball and chain off her ankle, and she was allowed a night of freedom, which she oh, greatly enjoyed. Awesome. So every yes, you should listen. Everybody should have a Kelsey. Everyone should have a, listen. If you need help with your cooking and your cleaning, um, if you need someone to contribute to your grocery bill, you should absolutely buy yourself a Kelsey. We got okay. one. It's it's a little broken. We have to put new batteries in it, but for the most part, it works just fine. And. Okay. And our and we took our Kelsey. We got our Kelsey goat horde. So oh, that was fun. Wow. Yeah. I took a new friend to the goat whore as well, by the way. OK, that's cool. Would they enjoy themselves? Oh, uh, she enjoyed herself very much. Turns out it was one of those deals where like there's no possible way this scared child is into death metal. She's like, what are you crazy? I love death metal. I'm like, God damn it. I never get this right. So <laughs> asked 27 people. Hey, you want to go to the death metal show? What's a goat whore? When I got to, and then the 28th person, I'm like, there's no way she'll go. And she's like, I totally want to go. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> anyway, that was that was a month ago Friday because time travel, by the way. Yes. Yes, it was. Because we're currently that. in because it's currently May 20th, uh, February 20th. May 20th. February it's May 20th. It's not May 20th. Yeah, it's a day. It's a day. February 20th. So, yes, Ant-Man, Quantumania, Foxy Brown, Pam Greer, and then Treme. Treme. That's right. <laughs> you know what's a week from tonight? Tell me. The single greatest movie of 2023. And that's going to be? It's going to be the movie that everyone should see. It's going to be bigger than Guardians of the Galaxy. It's going to be bigger than Avatar. It's going to be bigger than Gone with the Wind. Do you know what this movie is, Jesse Starcher? Of Cosine Bear. Podcast? Cosine fuck, Bear. Fuck you, Cosine Bear. <laughs> this is not a bear that does algebra. God damn it. <laughs> oh, it's great. It does, do go- it? it does do cocaine, Chris. You're a good boy. There it is go. Cocaine Bear, baby. Rawr. <laughs> I love it. Math destruction. No, no math. I just one typo, you fucking white people. God damn. <laughs> Cocaine bear. Oh, man. That's great. And, and this podcast. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Ladies and gentlemen, go check out the Rattlech and Broadcasting Network on Facebook. Give that a like. Stay up on the top of all the great podcasts that we have to offer. The W2M Network is out there. Also, you can give that a like on Facebook. I'm sure uh, you can find them on Twitter pretty easy. And I know we have all of the W2M shows showing up on the YouTube. Uh, so you can find them there. Like, subscribe, and never miss a show. The Source Material Comics Podcast. 
all sorts of great stuff in the archive. You can hear the source material show, which is what you're listening to right now. And then you can go check out the Unspoken Issues podcast where we focus on 90s comics. Uh, so if you like, if you dig the 90s, hey, we just talked about a comic con that happened in 97. You may want to check out that show as well. So with that being said, that's Mark Radlich. I'm Jesse Starcher. We'll talk to you soon. Have a good one. Uh, bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. All of this would not be possible without W2Mnet.com, so make sure to seek them out for more podcasts. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please feel free to share, and we look forward to entertaining you again soon. You have two choices, and really only two in this world, Jesse. I can either say you love me, Jesse Starcher, or I can call you Daddy. Your choice. Uh, Your move, officer. I'll take the former, sir. Thank you very much. (laughs) Right, so it hasn't aired yet, right? It it aired a month ago. See, this is where problems get started. (laughs) I am sitting here thinking that it actually aired, and I wonder if it actually aired. No, time travel. Okay, so this show... Yes, Jesse's going, fuck it, I got a tumor, a tumor, I'm a tumor, I'm a tumor, I'm a tumor, I'm a tumor, 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 tumor. give me the creative team. That's not all I'm going to give you. Let's Um, just keep it at that, please. (laughs) Stuck at, stuck at an out of town, uh, they sold, there you go, you're always fondling someone's junk. (laughs) Justin had no complaints, but, (laughs) Okay. This is why you only record with me once every three to six months. By the way. <laughs> are you are you figuring it out? <laughs> Sign here. You I'm gotta go. Right over here. <laughs> you laugh at my struggles, Mark Rattler. Listen, we sometimes you find yourself being a daddy dom, whether you like it or not, whether you whether you rise to the occasion or not, and you daddy dom the people around you because you know you have to. Somebody has to. I don't, I don't want this role. Do you not understand? I want missionary from you. That's all I want. <laughs> I just Sorry. lay down. The, the other really funny thing is fun. Now let's talk about littles. No, uh, just, please keep going. First off, I had the unfortunate please, disposition please, of coming please, upon please. that conversation in the chat, which I mute the chat, and the one time I decide to look at it, I get a dissertation on what a little is. Well, okay. Please, please tell I'm, me you had to look it up yourself. No, you guys did a great job explaining what was going on. When you are found in the ditch, all she has to do is go back into the archive and present said evidence to the judge, and the judge is like, oh yeah, I understand. Case is best.